So, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Francis Wallet. I'm uh, based in Montreal, uh, do bioinformatics consulting, but I was uh, 10 years here, associate director of informatics and biocomputing, and had a team of people involved in various aspects of pipelines and database and working on ICGC, what we'll talk about today, and so forth. So, actually, so the all the workshops, as we mentioned at the beginning, have a Creative Commons license, and it's a, um, uh, a CC BY and CC SA, which means BY you have to say who you got it from, who 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 is the author, and so you have to cite them, and share alike. That means that you, if you use data from these slides, uh, you have to share yourself. You have to share alike. And um, the it's sort of a bit of a viral sort of it's you, you have to pick which CC license which Creative Commons license you, you want, and we chose the uh, the share alike to encourage people to share, and as we think it's really important. Um, the uh, <coughs> the license also allows you to edit the, the things, which, which, which what that means is that you can take a slide, you can adapt it, you can modify it, you can take one slide out of the slide deck, you don't have to take the whole slide deck, you can just, you need one slide, you can just borrow it, and they're available in most lectures, but not all, but they're mostly available in PowerPoint and PDF, in uh, video as well, and, and so forth. So I encourage people to <coughs> record, tweet, film, whatever they blog, uh, live blog, whatever you want to do. But you should p be paying attention to me during the lecture too. Uh, disclaimer is that um, I may mention some products, some companies and whatnot. Uh, some years I don't, some years I do, and I don't profit from any of these companies. I worked five years at NCBI, and so I tend to promote NCBI equivalents over, let's say, EBI equivalents, and that's just because of where my path, of, of, of my career path. And I'm also a former OICR employee, and so I tend to, to talk of fondly of OICR stuff. So this is my email, my Twitter handle, and the Twitter handle for the bioinformatics workshops, bioinfo.ca. Um, I sent a tweet out already this morning showing the first class and a picture of the group and retweet and advertise and so forth. Please do so. Um, so today we're going to review databases, some visualization, but also mostly sort of getting you uh, out there and getting you started and, and really hopefully they sort of conclude the foundation that Michelle was just talking about. So this workshop is Bioinformatics for Cancer Genomics. If you're in the wrong workshop, it's, now is the time to leave. <laughs> um, and so we sort of looked at cancer genomics so far this morning, and so we're going to be looking a bit more at bioinformatics this afternoon. And, um, and we're going to sort of do the basic stuff as to, you know, why do we have bioinformatics? And we have bioinformatics because of the data, open data that we have to deal with. I mean, if we didn't have open data, then nobody would have had to make tools to address all this data. If it was everybody's private data sets, there would have not been the sort of the upsurge of, of, of tools developed over time that would allow this to happen. So how do we define bioinformatics or computational biology? And people define bioinformatics and computational biology differently. I tend not to do that. I tend to interchange terms. And so what we're going to do right now is that we're going to think, pair, and share, and write down. So you're going to talk to the person sitting next to you. And you're, and if there's only three of you, the three of you can talk and share together. And um, write down a definition of bioinformatics. Now, start talking, start sharing. Start writing. What do you think bioinformatics is? No, no Googling allowed. No, 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 no. Laptops down. Don't look it up. I mean, you're all registered for a bioinformatics workshop, so you should know what it is. I hope so. 
Okay, write it down now because I'm going to end this exercise very soon. Okay, who, who's got an answer that they want to share with the class? Yes, go in the back. I think the idea of bioinformatics, I think it's a kind of the using of the technology to understand the current state of, let's say, the biological interactions, and also using those kind of technology and knowledge to spend some kind of predictive models, what may happen in the future based on our current understanding. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Different, different, slightly modified, a tweak on what you heard so far? Okay. Yeah. Going more broad, um, using technology of any kind, as long as there's an underlying biological principle of government. So bioinformatics would include uh, monitoring birds through uh, video filming <laughs> migration, bird migration. I think one could make a case. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, you're... you're <laughs> some, somebody else? I'm sure there's somebody over here in the back row. Somebody can't speak? No, just uh, kidding. Is there, like, analysis of methods pertaining to open data? Okay. What? Well, I would add uh, the biological computational method that allows to analyze uh, genomic and genomic characters and genomic. You don't include metabolomics? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the, the omics in general. So here's my definition. But I wrote a textbook on it, so I sort of thought about it. <laughs> so bioinformatics is about integrating biological themes together with the help of computer tools and biological databases and gaining new knowledge about the system and study. So there's uh, it's a scientific discipline which is not just a technology i think and and this is where people computational biology and bioinformatics sort of get tossed about bioinformatics is more technology and and computational biology is more uh, a science i sort of not fully agree but I, I can see the point there but it's working and so the, the important part about bioinformatics here i i like to sort of carry forward is that it's actually biology that's driving the exercise. And so we're asking biological questions, and we're using computational tools to address those questions. So we use computational tools to look at the data, and we're talking about big data now and so forth. So it's really sort of important to, uh, to keep that in mind. But all, all the definitions are good. And computational biology and, and bioinformatics, there's three big areas. So there's data, the actual data that we work with, the tools that we apply to this data and the knowledge and how we capture the knowledge and how we transfer the knowledge to other people, how we share the knowledge and how we make progress so we understand we have development of a new drug that's affecting a, a, a specific gene. How do we tell the world and how do we share that, you know, that, this knowledge? And so that's a really important part. And so open science is really sort of critical for all of this. And so we saw some of these logos this morning uh, the open source logo, the open access is, deals with publications, so uh, access to, to publications, so that even though many of us are in very rich universities that have very good libraries that have all sorts of journals, there's a lot of places in the world that are equally brilliant scientists but don't have access to uh, some of the journals that we have access to in our universities, and really we're not always within the context or having the passwords of our university. Sometimes you graduate from a university and all of a sudden you find yourself here in a, working in a small biotech that doesn't have any access to any library. And yet you've lost all access to a lot of journals. And so it's really uh, open access publication is a really important one. Open data, we talked about this morning as well, is a really sort of important aspect with the restriction on controlled access and so forth. And, and I'll come back to that a bit later. 
And bioinformatics.ca is actually part of a, a, a goblet, which is a global organization for bioinformatics uh, learning, education, and training. And it basically encourages all the, the education material that we build and, and distribute to be available. And so it's not just bioinformatics.ca. If you go to the Goblet website, you'll see lots of organizations worldwide that are member of Goblet that make their material available. So, I mean, BLAST, how many of you have done a BLAST search before? Raise your hand high if you have. Don't be shy. So, okay. So BLAST is a basic local alignment search tool allows you to search a DNA or a protein databases with a DNA or protein or RNA or nucleotide or, or protein sequence. And it would not have been implemented if GenBank and Atlas, which was a protein database at the time at the early days, uh, didn't exist. And so there wouldn't have been a need for the development of a thing like BLAST or FASTA and FASTA and FASTP, which are the predecessors of those tools. And, um, and so, GenBank, the, the openness of the data, with GenBank being the nucleotide and protein uh, sequence databases of all publicly available sequences from all organisms, that database being open, one way to search it, sure, you can search with keywords and look, search for your favorite gene, but the way you want to search GenBank is you want to search with, by sequence similarity. And so BLAST allowed you to do that. And so the development of a BLAST, which is also, it's, it's, it's actually, it's more than open source. It's actually uh, it's owned by the the U.S. government. The NCBI, which is a U.S. government agency, owns the BLAST code, and it's actually they just made it public, so it's free for anybody to download. You're, it's so free that you can download it, repackage it, and sell it if you want. I mean, if you want to sell the, you can sell the BLAST code that you downloaded from NCBI. You're totally, it's a totally legal thing to do, and. Um, so there, the, the openness of that and BLAST, because of that, has been remastered and redone and reused. The code base has been used and modified and so forth and, and used uh, in a number of different ways. So when we're doing bioinformatics and we're doing a BLAST search, you're actually doing an experiment. People don't think of it as a sort of a biological uh, experiment, but it's, it's really the same thing. Is where, we have a sequence, we're gonna do a blast search against it, and we're gonna get a, a result, and we're gonna interpret the result. So it's important when you do an experiment that you know what your reagents are. And so you know the, the query that you're using and the database you're searching against, those are your reagents, right? And your method would be which blast kind of blast are you gonna do? Are you gonna do a protein against protein or a nucleotide against uh, protein or by translation and so forth. So there's various types of BLAST searches and knowing the method which you're going to report when you do your, your analysis and you do your interpretation is going to be part of that. And the interpretation of your alignment uh, is your, your testing a hypothesis. Is this, is, is this sequence, that I have, this gene that I sequence, is it similar to an existing gene for which there is information known and, uh, and you're testing that, that hypothesis. And so you have to know your reagents, you have to know your methods, and you have to know, you have to do your controls. So what's an example of a control you would do in a BLAST search? Let's say, yeah, just, I'm just going to randomly say that like that. See, what's an example of a control you would do for a BLAST search? The species effect? Could be, yeah. So that's a so what's so what would be the control? So let me let me help you guys a little bit. So one one control could be, you know, a gene is in the database. Your gene is in the database. So you expect to do with whatever parameters you choose in your BLAST search, because there's lots of parameters you can pick. You expect to find that gene because you know it's there. So if you do the BLAST search and you don't find anything. I would say that's a bad, it's a, it's a good control that maybe you're not configured your BLAST software well, but that's an example of you're expecting to see something, and if you don't see it, then there's something wrong. If you do see it then, it, then it's right. And vice versa, if you expect your gene not to be present, and then you do a search and you find a bunch of things, then maybe there's your, your uh, parameters are too loose and you're finding a bunch of similarities 
against things that shouldn't that are not real. So they're they're bogus hits, really, which is what we call a hit in a blast search. So these, are, I mean, you have to think about these controls when you do uh, experiments and when you submit. And and I'll I'll come back I'll come back to some of those later. So. Um, so databases is a way to organize information for us. It's a place where you can put things in it, in a database, and if all is well, you should be able to find it back out. I mean, that sounds silly a little bit, but I've made submissions to large databases, and people have told me, I've told people, oh yeah, it's in a database. People go make queries at that database and they can't find it. It got lost. And it got lost for simple reasons. The tags that were used to cl classify the, the sequence are in a specific slot. And when you do a search in that database for that tag, if it doesn't, if it's not in that slot, it doesn't find, it doesn't uh, index it basically. And so you, this, the, the tag may exist somewhere else in the, in the file in the XML or whatever. But if it's not at the right place, then it gets lost. And so we used to here submit all the data for or help and, and control all the data and monitor all the data that was submitted for the ICGC at the EGA uh, database and as, there's a it's better, much better now but there was a time where 30 to 40 percent of the sequences disappeared <laughs> and because they were not submitted properly with the wrong tags in the wrong place all and it, the way we found the data is we dumped everything and then we started grepping and looking for file names and, and so forth. They were all there, but they were at the wrong place. And so it's, it's a really important thing to, um, to get, get right. So, but that's a good check to do. If you submit something and, it's, and the, the, the repository where you deposit it says, okay, okay, we got it, thank you. Then you could go back out and see if you can get it back. If you can't, you know there's something wrong. Um, Ideally, a good database becomes a resource for other databases, right? So the, the RefSeq database at NCBI is sort of the standard reference genome for all organisms, including human. And that is used worldwide by many, even the EBI uses RefSeq and UCSC uses RefSeq and so forth. So all the big databases point to, and so they have a, a, an API, which is an application programming interface, which allows you to write queries that will get uh, or produce answers from the data that you have in your database. And so being able to do that is really sort of key and it makes your database that much better. Uh, it simplifies the information space that, by specialization. So you'll have cancer databases and so you'll have, it's be simplified in a sense, it'll be sort of cancer specific or you'll have other databases will be yeast specific. So. Uh, the Saccharomyces genome database is, if you're a yeast person, that's a database you're going to use. I heard there's a yeast person somewhere over here, yes. And so SGD is, is used by all the yeast people because it's got a repository of all the gene, yeast gene names and lots of experiments of very various types. Um, and ideally, you can make discoveries. So what do you I mean making discoveries in a database? Is you find associations between records which the people that put the data in the database in the first place didn't think about, but you're going to do queries and you're going to pull out things together that nobody had put, thought about putting together. And that's really sort of the, the, the really important thing. And, and, and for that, is an important thing to understand is the data model. And what do we mean by data model? So for example, what's the key identifier for a given record in that database? Is it the gene? Is it a gene focused uh, database? Is it a nucleotide focused database? Do, uh, or is it chromosome focused? Or is it cancer focused? Or whatever, whatever the focus and the related sort of boxes and so forth and relationships between the entities within a database is really important to understand. How do you find that information? That's a very good question. So good databases will have published a paper <laughs> explaining uh, how that is organized. And uh, my friends at uh, ICGC, so the ICGC database has been out for about 10 years and the paper just came out last year. And so it's finally, it took a while. But I've worked on a, 
many lives ago, I worked on a, on a database of protein-protein interaction. And that's the first thing we did was to publish the data model. And so we uh, <coughs> explained how, what the entities were and so forth. And so you, you publish it, you get it peer reviewed and so forth. And that's really sort of important. So other databases like GenBank and things like that, which have uh, yearly or bi-yearly uh, publications, have usually on their website a, a quite detailed sort of uh, data model on how things are organized. But that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah. So there's metadata about uh, about data. For, that's metadata is data about data, basically. And so create date, update date, submitters ORCID. Does anybody know what an ORCID ID is? ORCID. Any idea? It's a database of people of authors. It's authors. So it's a unique identifier for, for authors, for, for scientists. So in the ORCID database, you should all have your ORCID ID memorized. No, tattooed. No. <laughs> you should all have one anyways. And, uh, and if you don't, you can go to the ORCID website, and, and they'll be happy to supply you one. And so there are journals. So I'm an editor at uh, PLUS Computational Biology. And there, we actually, all the editors all have, a, we, on the website, we have all our ORCID IDs there. So you can go see what is actually we publish is actually associated with our names. So a publisher would be in a, another example of metadata, book title, and so forth. So the data itself could be a DNA sequence file, could be a cosmic record. Cosmic, we'll, we'll talk a bit about, more about it later. A protein protein interaction record, a title of a book, or the book itself. It could be the data. A storage system could be a box where I put everything into. Oracle is a very expensive commercial uh, uh, relational database system. MySQL is now commercial <coughs> but less expensive, much less expensive. A binary file or a text file or a bookshelf would be a storage system. A query system is, is could be a list you look at and say, oh yeah, do I have this book in, in, my, in my bookshelf, a catalog. An index file, SQL is structured query language, is a way of, of looking up, um, it's a special sort of uh, language to, to ask queries of a database, of relational databases. Elasticsearch is now used in, in sort of like things like Amazon and, and Hadoop and so forth, larger uh, scale. And grep is a Unix tool that allows you to look for a string match against uh, a file, and I'm sure you all used grep uh, last week when you were doing your pre-workshop assignments, and so you'll use it again this week. And an information system, so that's sort of the overarching sort of system that's, so the Library of Congress could be viewed as an information system, <coughs> Google could be viewed as an information system. And in our world we have Entree and Ensemble are both sort of information systems, so they're complex entities of, of information that work together. The UCSC Genome Browser and the ICGC are all sort of ecosphere of information that sort of work together and interact with together and have rules that and, and obey these rules within this, this, this complex. So a place like NCBI will offer you a way to submit your data and so if you sequence a gene that's of interest that's never been sequenced or a variant that, that, that doesn't have any, that's never been sequenced, you can either submit it to a variant database or a new gene would be to a uh, gen bank and things like that. You can download, you can learn, they have lots of workshops and, and you can develop lots of software development, you can add lots of analysis tools and, and ways to research. So if you go to this page, uh, query is actually and you put this query in all square bracket filter, a closed square bracket, you will get actually the, um, and this one is from last year, but basically you could do it this year, and you would get the number of records in each of all, these are all the major NCBI databases. And so you can see how much has grown from last year to this year, if you do this search yourself right now. <coughs> So things offered at NCBI from the literature point of view is PubMed and PubMed Central, which have, uh, are the, PubMed Central would have link the, the full text articles of open access journals. 
Um, from a health point of view, these things like dbGaP and ClinVar, on the genomic side, they would have whole genome sequencing sequences and RefSeq. On the protein side, they would have sequences, protein sequences, and 3D structures. And they, in the chemicals, they have PubChem and biosystems and so forth. So, so they're, they're offering quite a bit of, of the kind of stuff that uh, we use. So formats, so we talked a little bit about FASTQ uh, this morning, and, and tomorrow we'll, we'll get even more details into the specific sort of tags that are used in a FASTQ file. But FASTQ files are what comes out of a DNA sequencer. So there's the, the, the actual base call and the how good, how good we feel about the quality of that base call. So there's actually a, for each base, there's a value of the quality of that base. In a GenBank file, you, or a FASTA file, which is just a nucleotide of the protein from a DNA, from a GenBank record, you do not have that. You, you assume in a GenBank record that every nucleotide is correct, every nucleotide is 100% that, and that it's a truth, basically. And um, it often is, because the GenBank record is actually the result of multiple sequencing and controlling type <coughs> experiments. It's the alignment of the consensus from a large scale of alignment. And if there's uncertainty, then it's marked in the code itself. It'll be an N or the other uh, uh, um, uh, alternative nucleotides. And, and that's, uh, that exists there. And then, and then we're going to deal with that this as well this week, is SAM and BAM. So those are alignment files. So those are when you have your stack of, when uh, Trevor was talking about, you know, 40x coverage, that file that we were looking at was actually a BAM file, which was actually used to exist as a SAM file. So BAM is just a binary version of a SAM file. And so those have... Uh, SAM is a readable, obviously text readable file, and I human readable file, and BAMs are, are only is, because it's binary can only be read by by software tools, which is some of the things we'll be doing uh, this week as well. And then VCF are files that show the variation of the files that you're looking at. So now you're starting to get into the weed of the the other file formats, and so. Um, uh, like uh, Trevor talked about, the, the, so the pipelines, you know, we'll, we'll start with a FASTQ file, it'll get transformed into a BAM, SAM file, which again, transformed into a BAM file, and so forth, and then VCF, and so forth. And there's many, many more. So if you have any questions about all the various file formats, the UCSC, so that UCSC is a University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, which is the home of the very famous UCSC genome browser, which of the, it's probably one of the best genome browsers in, of, of, gener of the generic type um, that are available out there. But they've also, they've, they've been around for a long time and they've accumulated a lot of, uh, of very useful knowledge. And one of which is they have a page which has all the various file formats, and you click on each one, and they have description of, of these file formats. So I separate databases in sort of two sort of categories. So one would be sort of primary, where it sort of more becomes archival, and then the other one becomes second. I call secondary or curated, and the secondary curated databases are are the result of often of human activity that where curation takes place and where there's a value added above the archival primary data. And so, and the, the line is, is quite fuzzy between the two. So uh, GenBank, for example, is a, people submit sequences to GenBank and they, they show up in GenBank. But they actually get curated and there's actually, I used to be in charge of GenBank when I was at NCBI and, I had 25 people working for me full time, and we were curating all of GenBank. And so, it, it's uh, but GenBank is part of the ENA, which is the European Nucleotide Archive, and DDBJ, the DNA database from Japan. And th those three together, so any record in GenBank could have come from Europe or Japan. And I'd say the ratio is about 
uh, say 50 <coughs> plus from GenBank, 30 plus from ENA, and 15 or whatever the difference is from DDBJ. And it would vary from, from category to category. The short read archive is, uh, is another example of primary database. Uniprod is a protein database at the EBI. Um, PubMed is publications also at NCBI, PMC, PubMed Central. Intact is a protein-protein interaction database. I would say it's the there are dozens, if not not maybe not hundreds, but between ten and a hundred uh, interaction databases out there. Some are specialized, and Intact is the most sort of all interactions and it, mostly protein-protein, but there's some protein RNA as well. Um, ICGC. Uh, is hosted in part here and in part at the EBI. We'll come back to that later. And EGA is a European Genome Archive. Uh, European? It's not Genome Archive. It's there's another word for it. Anyway, it's the um, controlled access part of, of, of uh, at the... Uh, it's European Genomic and Phenomic Archive. That's, actually, that's why it's a funny title, because it's missing a letter. <laughs> and so forth. So secondary RefSeq I mentioned is like the it's the the best record from GenBank that got sort of the RefSeq label. So everything in GenBank is owned by the submitter, right? So if I submit something to GenBank, it will belong to Francis for the rest of my life. RefSeq is owned the whole RefSeq database is owned by NCBI. So what they did is they went into GenBank, they picked their favorite record for their favorite gene and they called it they made it their own. So they made a copy they reference where they got it from, but then they, they, they said, this is our copy. And so we're making the reference genome, it's the best reference chromosome, it's the best reference mRNA, it's the best reference protein, the best annotation, and so forth for that gene. And so some of it is stolen from, taken, borrowed, shared from the, what's in the gen bank, but the rest is, is basically from the curators at NCBI. The genes the database at NCBI is probably the best repository for all the information about genes that, that there is out there. Taxon, as you can imagine, is about taxonomic and all that. There's about half a million different taxes that are represented in, in, in nucleotide and protein sequences. And NCBI is a repository that all other databases, so they all use the same taxon IDs, they all use the same taxonomy. We only care about one taxon in this class for this course. The, that of Homo sapiens, but uh, there are many other taxons that exist out there. Uh, OMIM, has anybody ever used OMIM? Know what OMIM is? What does it stand for? Online Mendelian Inheritance Man. Online Mendelian, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. So it's basically, uh, it's a database it, they go across the chromosomes and they try to add, assign a disease, a function to every gene in the human uh, in the human genome. And so you can imagine it's, it evolved quite a bit with the sequencing of the human genome. But there are lots of genes for which we still have a chunk of DNA for which we don't know. We don't have necessarily any disease associated with it, cancer or, or, or otherwise. And so there's, uh, but it still maintains, uh, it's still quite used uh, extensively. The mods are also very important to so the model organism database. And so why are the mods, so let's see, do I have a slide? Yeah, why are the mods so important? And so you have Flybase for Drosophila, you have MGI for mouse, RGD for rat, SGD for Saccharomyces for yeast, uh, Wormbase for C. elegans, Zfin for um, zebrafish, and uh, then on top of that you have gene ontology, which is basically trying to describe every gene, function, uh, product, and so forth, into an organized, harmonized way, and through an ontology, so so that you can dis assign a specific activity, enzymatic activity, for example in one organism and it will have in a different organism it will be the same enzymatic activity and therefore it will have the same go term. And so gene ontology or go has been used to uh, ascribe a gene product uh, description. And all of these genes are important, all of these mods 
are critical in our understanding of the human genome because through similarity searches, through uh, interaction database, through pathway sharing and so forth, we're able to assign a gene from a model organism on which it's a lot easier to do lots of experiments, deletion experiments, fusion experiments, modification, uh, modifying the active sites and things like that, and then in a mod and then doing the, the assays and tests in, in the model organism and then projecting that information onto the human genome. And that's how most human genes have been interpreted is through experiments done in model organisms. And so sometimes you have to do it in mice or you know a mammal or something like that. But a lot of genes in yeast are, are actually have uh, orthologous functions in, in, in humans. And so it's some really uh, classic uh, yeast experiments. And you can tell I'm a former yeast person. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I've been done in the yeast genome. And, and so that a lot of um, function of, of human genes have been done through work in, in yeast. And so once a year, uh, the uh, Nucleic Acid Research Journal publishes a, a database issue. And in this database, you will have sort of the, the creme de la creme of all databases in the world. And this, many, the top tier databases are invited every year, like NCBI, EBI, DBJ, those guys, uh, the protein structure databases, um, RNA, PFAM, RFAM, all those guys are invited to, to submit an article. And it's usually, they're usually short, they're about three, four pages long. But many other, databases out there want to be in, included in this issue and this issue has become quite big although it's only electronic now it used to print quite big but now it's only electronic but so what they have to do now is not all databases and once you're in one year then you, you sort of automatically and you were re-invited the following year if you were still active but that doesn't it sort of grew too big and so what they've done now is some databases are invited every year, but only a small handful. All the other ones are invited every second year. So you have to look at two years' worth of journal to see the full database set. But then after, in the two years, if you look at the last two years, you have the, the current sort of creme de la creme. It's not every database, but it's the, it's the top ones that are being used in the community. And it's usually um, the editors are pretty strict about their inclusion and having enough people that actually use their resource so it's one thing to publish a paper to get a database published. It's another thing to get people to use it. And so they, but the ones in this journal are, are heavily used. I actually work in another journal from the same publisher. So this is Oxford University Press, OUP. I work on a, data, a journal called Database. And so, so this one you can submit to once a year. Our journal you can submit any time of the year, <laughs> FYI. So, so quickly sort of switch, look at the gen, uh, flat file format or a file format. And it's not that it's that crucial for the work we're going to do this week to understand how files are how, uh, given that a bit, the gen bank flat file format and how important it is. But it's important to understand the sort of in general uh, how things are organized in a record. And so and I'll take the, the GenBank flat file as an example. So in a GenBank flat file, you have a header, which will have the title, taxonomy, and citation, which are things that affect the whole record. And so the, the citation is not just part of the nucleotide or so forth. It, it affects the whole thing. And then you have specific things within the record, and these are the features, where I say this part codes for the RNA, this part codes for a promoter, or this part codes for this and that. And so there you'll have different features that affect different uh, part. Although there's, I look at the first feature, which is the source, which actually has uh, is attributed to the whole record. Then you'll have the actual DNA sequence. And like I mentioned before, this DNA sequence is uh, you have no sc quality scores or anything like that. It's all assumed in GenBank. It's assumed to be of one one quality. And the GenBank flat file is you may not think so, but it's actually meant to be a human readable format. And so um, there are many other formats that you can look at uh, sequences. 
and looking at specific genes and special, specific records is sort of almost old-fashioned and so I'm sort of aging myself talking about that right now and now these nowadays ways of looking at a genome it will be through a browser through uh, a, a, a genomic so sort of browser type activities where you'll see little arrows where the genes are and so forth it'll be much more macroscopic uh, vision than natural nucleotide or, or gene at the gene level but um, it, GenBank is still receiving lots of submissions from many organisms, um, and uh, what many things you can submit, you know, genomic sequences, transcriptomic sequences. You cannot submit protein sequences. Your protein sequences are always deduced from a nucleotide, and there are very, very few protein sequence only submission databases. And there, you're entering more into the mass spec type of, of resources and and this is uh, NCBI does not do that right now so quickly accession number space it's sort of historical but there's a one important thing to, to realize is that it's expanding so they ran out of space basically when they first thought about that the model said our accession uh, numbers will be one letter well, I'm running out of time 15 minutes I've always run out of time. I remove lots of slides. Um, but it's usually uh, a letter, a number, and so forth. But now the important part is that there's a, a dot version. So you'll have U12345.1. And what that means is that's version one of that record. Dot two means that, and this is a part of the model, is that the nucleotide was changed, not the annotations. The annotations may, may have 20 other annotations. But if the sequence hasn't changed, it's still dot one. But if you change, if you change the nucleotide by one nucleotide, it becomes dot two. If you change the DNA sequence by 10,000 nucleotides and you do it in one shot, it becomes dot two as well. So the, the, the increment size of the version doesn't tell you how big the change was. It just tells you that change, there was a change. And why is that important? When we look at the genome, the whole genome, we know exactly where we are in the genome. We know the assembly. We know the exact position of where that gene is. And that gene is there of that version of that assembly. And if the assembly changes, it becomes dot two as well. So there, in assemblies, we talk about patch level. So there's, there's, uh, we talk about version GCRH38, for example, patch 22. So there's been 22 patches. What that means is that during the last few years, a patch will have changed where they will have changed within a region the sequence, but it would not have changed the distance outside of that region. And so a patch will change, let's say, one gene. You'll change all the letters within one gene, but it will not change where the gene starts and where the gene ends. That will stay fixed, and then within the patch, you'll have the changes within there. RefSeq. I mentioned also has accession number, but the accession number looks different, and it's different from all the others. It's not a letter and then a numbers. It's two letters, N for NCBI, G or M or R or P, and then underscore and then a number. And those are RefSeq. So if you see one of those N star underscore a number, you know you're dealing with a RefSeq accession number. And they also have dot versions as well for them. So all of that is described in the NCBI paper. They all have genome browsers. They all have, I mentioned the UCSC is probably the, the most widely used one. Ensemble is heavily used. And NCBI, MapViewer is, for some reason, nobody likes it. But that's that. <laughs> and of course, ICGC, which I'll talk about now, it also has the, their, their genome browser. The information about a gene, I mentioned gene, the gene database in Altree is, is the best source of that information. And the, a lot of resources like the ICGC will point to that resource. So I mentioned assemblies for the human genome, or actually for many of the model organisms. Uh, so there's an assembly for the human genome. And right now we're in um, HG38 uh, or HG, uh, which is the GRCH38, which is the most 
well, it's the most recent, so it's from December 2013. And so that's important to know when you're doing any query on the human genome, which database is this genome using, which reference genome are you using, and so you know where you are in, in the world. So it's like you know which planet you're on. So historical perspective, so we had express sequence tags in, uh, in the 90s. We had a genome mapping and a sequencing, uh, again, late 90s. Uh, population analysis, polymorphism, all the SNP databases, genome-wide and GWAS studies, and then the infamous Homer paper that uh, Mark referred to, which basically closed down everything and made everything sort of private and under controlled access, and so minimize uh, usage in my mind. But, so the example that he talked about, is says, you know from a very few SNP, you can know if you took part in uh, controlled or, or targeted and the, the paper in, uh, that the Homer paper referred to is a study on schizophrenia. So you knew if you had SNPs and that, that if your SNPs, you're part of that study, you knew are you the control group or are you the schizophrenic group? And people didn't want to have that information out there. I don't know why, but anyways. Uh, and we had a cancer genome atlas pilot. We had the 1000 Genome Project. Those were all open uh, genomes, actually, and they were all consented that way. The Cancer Genome Project and the ICGC um, came uh, in sort of the late uh, 2000. There were a number of large-scale uh, whole genome and cancer genome analyses where they're uh, sequencing several genes, not all genes, but many genes, and uh, some of them quite deeply in many patients. and uh, they were uh, making, they could see there was some uh, things that were happening, that many mutations were happening, not necessarily in the same gene all the time, but in similar pathways and for certain types of cancer. So there was some hints of things that could be quite interesting. And so they decided to do a much larger project and that, um, and start off the ICGC. And so the, uh, the project in the ICGC was to collect 500 tumor normal pairs from 50 different tumor cancer types. So that's 25,000 tumors and 25,000 controls. So it's 50,000 genomes that were sequenced for this project. And that was a 10 year, the idea was to do that in 10 years. And for initially, they were hoping for every one of those, but it ended up being only a subset to do genome, transcriptome, metalome, and uh, clinical data. So they got clinical data on all of them, but not some of it not very deep. Uh, methylome was about, I'd say, 20% plus. Transcriptome was about uh, 30, 40%. And then genomes, they all had genome, but about 10, 15% had whole genomes, and then the rest was exomes. And so they, they was partial. And the idea is to Look, if you look at 500 of a certain tumor type, you'll see common mutations in a given tumor type. <laughs> the big assumption, and so, and the idea is you will see what, why 500, what that number come from. The idea is you will see events that happen in 1% of the cases at the very least. So if it's 1%, if you sample 500, you should see it at least once, 19 times out of 20 or whatever. And so that's where that number came from. The big thing that they didn't think about at the time they were planning this experiment is that, okay, I'm going to collect, let's say, 50 or 500 pancreatic cancer. Do I have, do I have in my population that I'm looking at, do I have one type of pancreatic cancer or do I have subtypes of pancreatic cancer? We now know this, for example, for breast cancer. Breast cancer is... 10 subtypes or more. And so you would need to get 500 of each subtype to see events that are 1% or less. If you want, if now you have 10 subtypes and you've collected only 500, you know, you're not, you're only going to see events that are happening 10, 15, 20% of the time. So you're going to be missing a lot of things uh, at that rate. And so some cancers did get, so breast cancer is a good example, where there were many breast cancer projects. And so there, they have four or 5,000 breast cancers. And so there you can sort of see the subtypes and so forth. And some of them are actually subtype specific. Yes? So I just, maybe I just missed that point. Uh, the, 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 the 
is that, for example, we are looking for a kind of persistent pattern of mutation which can contribute to cancer. Yes. So some people go to that, okay, for example, that mutation is called as that cancer. So well, so it, it's involved. So it, the causal, yeah, the causal is another step that you have to do in your analysis. What you can do in a cancer genome analysis is you can go look at signatures. You can find patterns of mutations which can sort of give you insights. For example, the skin cancer, you can see uh, a UV light signature. So UV light hits the genome a certain way, and you see certain transitions that are specific to cancers caused by UV light. So, so you can't see those things. So there you can do a cause and effect. In lung cancer, you can sort of see a cigarette signature as well. And so you, you have, but then you have non-smoking small cell, you know, lung cancer, which is another type of cancer, which is another by that non-smokers get. And so, so they, they have a different signature, of course. So oh. it's from the signature, the first one is just going to for the pattern of those mutations which cause, it. not the cause, just the pattern, consistent pattern. Yes, and and so yeah. Uh, let me we we can talk a little bit more about it, but yeah, that's the idea. And so this project is humongous, and so it's no one country could do it. Although one country did try to do it all, but they quite didn't do it all. And so it's international. It was led out of here, out of the YCR, uh, by Tom Hudson, who was a director at the time, and uh, and it involved uh, a large scale of people from from all over the world. But it allowed us to do standards. It allowed us to do controlled access data in a centralized way. It allowed us to uh, use standards on, on produ production of data and so forth. And so tumor information, patient information, samples, how to collect it, sequence, and standard formats and analysis and so forth. So this is uh, all the This is from about, um, yeah, from May 2018. This project is basically finished, and um, uh, and it's involved a large number of countries. But you can see on the on your left side is that uh, NIH funded, NCI and NHGRI funded uh, almost half the projects in in the ICTC. So, and most of those projects are TCGA projects. So TCGA is part of ICTC, and um, I would say out of the uh, 50, yeah, a bit small, less than half, but, but not, not much less than half. But you have every, you know, Canada did uh, people in BC, uh, Toronto involved in the project, Brazil, every continent is represented except Africa. So there's nobody, um, unless you count Saudi Arabia, sort of is Northern Africa. <laughs> Um, and so uh, Europe, most countries in Europe were involved, uh, Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and so forth. So it is, and we would do a meeting every nine months at one of these countries. And so it's a lot of traveling. And so this is the growth, this is a classic, it could be a growth of GenBank, could be the growth of ICGC. It has cinq minutes, okay. <coughs> Uh, so all this data is hosted at ICGC, and it's a portal that has access to controlled access to DACO, the Data Access Co uh, Compliance Office. This is how to get access to the data. There's uh, the data portal, and so there's lots. There's a can cancer projects focus, so you can look at uh, what a cancer project has found. There's a project entity, so like all the breast cancer projects are, can be found together. Uh, gene entity page, so all the pages that have all the mutations for a given gene is, is present here. Um, it has a reactome pathway entity page, and so we'll talk about that uh, later this week, and we'll, we'll, uh, Robin Hall will, will, will tell us more about this. Um, mutation, so every mutation in ICGC is, is, is tracked, um, and then you can do some query, complicated queries about uh, this tumor type, uh, in RNA, in genomic, in, um, in this tissue, not that tissue, that sex, not that sex, and so forth. There's ways to, to do data analysis. There's ways, there's data repositories, so where you can go get uh, actual data from, from um, 
where there are many places where the data is kept and so it's, it's, it's all maintained there. And so the main one we talked about is TCGA and ICGC and all they come together, all the open data, so because mutation is all open data, right? You don't need controlled access to have access to mutation because mutation, yes, I know, she keeps, you, she's doing a good job, she's already been, yes, you are, I am too. And, um, and so ICGC, the BAM file, which has all the genetic information, which is the controlled access information, the germline information, is kept at the EGA at the, uh, in Europe, and in the TCGA is kept now in Chicago in, uh, for, for in the US. And so TCGA, I mentioned, is part of ICGC. They have differences of tumor types and so forth, and uh, they have, as, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, they have all have what's open and what's closed, which is slightly different. And the big difference is that NIH, an open access, a mutation that comes from a whole genome is not considered open data. A mutation that comes from a whole exome is considered open data. And the reason is, is that they think that whole genome leaks out too many germline variants by accident and therefore because of that they control it controlled access data and so if you're looking at data sets and you're thinking oh there's lots of stuff from europe and canada but nothing from the u.s is because maybe you're looking at a whole genome and you're looking at an open data set and you're looking at whole genome data and therefore it would not have any u.s data in it so you have to keep those things in mind you have to understand the data model and now all the mutations end up in a cosmic database, which is a uh, uh, European Sanger at this, uh, uh, database, different from EBI, but next door, that, that maintains the, the cosmic database. And, um, and it's, uh, yeah, so that's there. That's sort of, uh, Mark had these slides. So basically controlled access, you fill out the form, you, with who you are, and if you try to submit the form and you haven't filled out the stuff well, then it all shows up in red. I said, oops, I got it wrong. I correct everything, it's all green. I'm feeling happy, you should have a little happy face. And you submit it, you sign it, and then you get it signed. The idea here is that you're agreeing to all the things that Mark talked about, and you don't want, you're getting signed by somebody who can fire you, all right? So should you digress and do something you're not supposed to do, then somebody who's your VP scientific, uh, not scientific affairs, VP research at your university or, or your, big, your big boss or whatever will get a phone call from somebody at ICGC, from McGill probably, and tell you that you, you haven't uh, uh, done the things properly. And so there's publication embargo, but now actually this is not relevant anymore because uh, all the stuff has been online for so many years that it's all there's no more embargo on it now. All the ICGC stuff is f free for you to uh, to publish on, and it's available from two different uh, archives. So we're dealing with big data, and big data evolves over time. Uh, on the top there is uh, five megabytes that's getting lifted into an airplane, and and uh, we have mail attachments now, five megabytes, right? <laughs> and, and below is a 10 terabyte hard drive, which fits on my desk. And so things, things I, but to age myself, so 10 years ago, I got a grant, a CFI grant for a, a one terabyte hard drive, and it cost me a quarter of a million dollar. Okay. And it was the size of a fridge. <laughs> so, um, so the big thing that we talked about also today is that the size of data sets are getting so big, like we were talking about petabyte scale, and that's why we have to go to cloud computing because you have to now take your computes to where your data is. You can't download, eNotes relatively easy to download to your laptop, it's just too too big to do. And so you have to, you have to do the thing on, on, the, on your, at the cloud because that's where the, it's a lot easier to transfer a software then it is to transfer the whole data set. Um, lots of documents available online. PCOG, which I won't have time to talk about. So what I'll just say rapidly, 
peak hog analysis, we did an analysis of 2,800 tumor normal whole genome pairs. And so it's a whole genome analysis of, of the, it's a separate data set. It exists in a number of places as PCOG. So if you see PCOG, you know that, what that is. And I invite you to go look at, so many of the papers in PCOG, there's 81 papers or so right now that have PCOG as a search term, but basically all the PCOG projects have been, are published or are on bioarchive and are available for you. And they're all coming out in Nature and, and, and journals, the Nature Publishing Group and so forth. Uh, there's a description of PCOG on the ICGC website. There's a great portal. So the portal for uh, IC, uh, TCGA was actually built by the same team that built the portal for ICGC. So you, if you can maneuver the ICGC portal, you'll be very good at maneuvering the TCGA and the cancer data portal at NIH. And this is in, actually in uh, the GDC is in Chicago. And, but it's a NIH-funded uh, cancer data. So all the data, the URLs are here. The collaboratory is another project out of the OICR, which will be in the workshop probably next year. And so just, just a teaser to tell you it's coming down. And so the challenge is that open data is controlled access data. There's not enough eyeballs on the data. Eyeballs on the data are needed to make discoveries. And so we need to, to, to increase the culture of sharing openly, public funding agencies, consortium, mentors, peers, the new generation versus my generation, which is not very open, I would say, except for me. And uh, that has to become the norm. And final thoughts, access to data is essential for science. Getting data that is fair is hard work. I didn't talk about fair data, but that's important. It is essential to share the work you do with if you want to be recognized, get tenure, get a job promotion, and so forth. Uh, human data is more complicated, we, I, I grant you that, but we, got, we have to find ways to make it more open and, and more usable, and there's, there's ways to think about that and discuss about that. There's a lot of material out there, learn from it, and cite your sources. So my last message to students and young PDFs and investigators, be open so people can see how great you are. Thank you.